The scripture I want to share with you this morning from the gospel is to many of you, I hope, familiar. But there are so many aspects to it that every time I read it, I find I've seen and learning something that somehow had evaded me before. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the New Testament, and I'm reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Listen for God's word. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to the man, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. There were no public health departments in the first century certainly not in Palestine. Somebody was sick, had to be approved as being well enough to be no social threat. They had to go to the priests. And the ritual was to make an offering to God of thanksgiving for the improvement in one's health. That's why Jesus said, go to the priests. Now one man out of ten happened to notice on the way that the lesions on his arms seemed to be going away. Now you and I know that leprosy in the first century was a terrifying disease. It demanded that people could no longer live with others because people thought it was terribly contagious. And so, as it said, these 10 lepers kept a very respectful distance from Jesus. They didn't run right up to him, but they yelled loudly and clearly what their need was. And he, was, he heard them. You and I believe that we can pray and that we can ask God to help us when we have problems. Be those problems, difficult relatives or neighbors, personal health issues, financial issues, you name it. We all have them. What happened? 
happens when God doesn't seem to hear our prayers? What happens if we are not instantly healed or given an encouraging prognosis? How do we deal with that? Does that mean that God doesn't love us? Or that we don't pray right? Whatever right is. <laughs> do we allow ourselves to be deluded into the theological position that says we have a contract with God if we ask in prayer God's supposed to deliver as we ask and what do we think if we pray and God chooses not to deliver as we ask does that mean we don't know how to pray right Or does it mean that we have to understand that God who created us and who loves each one of us is sovereign over our prayers and who may choose to teach us things through hard times that we could not have learned any other way. That's hard, isn't it? You know, most of us, we enjoy the comfort of a gospel. Just ask God, he'll take care of it. I didn't study, but Lord, you'll get me through this exam, right? And you give me a high enough grade so that I don't have to retake the test, right? You know, sometimes, even as adults, we carry that kind of childish mentality. God loves us. But God teaches us through life experiences. And I'd be a liar if I didn't stand here and tell you that there are not times when I'm feeling grateful for what the Lord wants to teach me when he says no. But I need it. If I'm going to grow in faith and in witness, and so I pray for the holiness to grow into the understanding that if God gives me a burden, he's going to help me carry it. And if it's really tough, his strength is even tougher, which means... We are not defeated, ever, if we trust him. Leprosy, in the understanding of first century people, was highly contagious. And therefore, anybody who got it was immediately socially ostracized. They had to leave their house, they had to leave their marriage if they were family people. <laughs> They had to stay away from other folks who were not diseased. And as you might not be surprised to know, sometimes lepers kind of banded together. Misery loves company. And so Luke says there were 10 of them in this group. But did you notice? They recognized Jesus. They knew exactly who he was. And they knew the power of God worked in him. And so, with full confidence, at a respectful distance, do you notice they didn't get too close, they yelled, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus didn't make a big deal out of it. He simply said, go and show yourselves to the priests. The priests functioned as the public health department. They had to say whether you were okay or not, and then you made your 
thank you offering to God. They obeyed. They turned and they headed toward the nearest priest. Interestingly enough, one person, when he realized that his arms seemed to be clearer, that the scarring and the, the lesions seemed to be vanishing before his very eyes. And he stopped in his tracks, and Luke says, and he turned around, and he went back to find Jesus. And when he got to Jesus, he fell on his face on the ground. That the word is he prostrated himself. Remember, in the ancient Middle East, when you came in the, pre in the presence of a king or somebody really high up, you got down on your knees sometimes, and sometimes more than that, you put your whole face on the ground. The presumption, of course, is that your bones are still agile enough to allow you to do that. I'm being facetious, but you know what I mean. This man recognized that God had given him an incredible gift. That God had taken away that which made him unable to be a part of human society anymore. That he could go home and hug his wife and love his kids and take care of his aging parents. He could do all those things because God heals him through his son Jesus. Now, gratitude is a beautiful thing. When you were a kid, did your mother ever say to you, phone your grandmother and thank her for the birthday card she sent you? It would usually have a few dollars in it. Thankfulness is not only socially encouraged, it is spiritually encouraged. I'm not talking about etiquette. You know what I'm talking about. Recognizing the blessings we have when we know that there are so many who don't have them. God never promised us an easy existence. And in your baptism, you are not baptized into the comforts of divine love only. You are baptized into the challenges of Christian discipleship. And sometimes that's a tough road. And I'm looking at some people in this room this morning, and I know you understand how tough that road can be. But God gives us one promise, one promise that we can count on. I will be with you. Whatever happens, I'll bear with you. You are not alone. You are not destitute. Accept that gift of my promise of presence and power in your own life. Pastors visit in rehab hospitals a lot. And it's amazing the differences in personalities, regardless of whatever the prognosis the person, the patient may have, there are always those who will tell you what a raw deal they've gotten and God's, they feel like God's really forsaken. But you know, 
you run into people who say, well, I've got some really nice services. And they, they're really, they're really kind to me. And they, they, they come in and really try to comfort me and give me what I need. And in fact, the food around here isn't too bad, actually. And you know, it goes from there. From the roommate who's pretty deaf and has the TV blasting almost below the pain level, to the roommate who won't talk to you at all, to the roommate who may have a list of complaints a mile long if you've had that patience to listen to them all. There are always people who can see where their blessings are, even though things may not be ideal for them. What about the posture of thankfulness? What does it do for you? Does it do anything? I, I want to share with you this because I, I was, it really blew me apart. It, uh, I watched this television show a couple years ago and a group of psychiatrists were talking, <laughs> obviously, about mental health. And one of them said that over his 38 years in practice, he had begun to realize that there was a medication that's not on any pharmacist's shelf, and it's the medication called gratitude. It's the medication of saying, Lord, thank you for Medicare. Thank you for a doctor who is not so concerned about a 20 minute limit on your interview, but has time to really, really pay attention to what's hurting you and act like he actually cared. What about persons who have really noticed how many blessings they have? We look at the television news and see the Turks bombing the, our former allies, and we see pain and misery all over the TV screen. And we realize for most of us, that is not now our issue, nor please God will it ever be. But there are people for whom every day is full of pain and fear. And yet, in some of the pictures, you notice how people have their arms around each other, how people try to help each other, even in the midst of all that mess that somehow there is a word called compassion <clears throat> between human beings that actually materializes sometimes and people are blessed by it and lifted up by it. Gratitude can change the most horrific situations when you are able to look at your blessings. If I ask you this morning, give you paper and pencil and say, how about writing 10 things you're grateful for in your life? What are the things that God has given you that make your life worth living? Even though everything in your life is not now nor never will be perfect. Can you think of those things? My friends, gratitude changes people. You know that? The psychiatrist pointed out that they could tell pretty quickly how long it's going to take somebody to heal. Because examining one life, one's own life usually demands the ability to forgive the people who've let you down, to forgive the parents who aren't as perfect as you had expected them to be, to forgive the friends who may not always be as strong on your side as you expect them to be. Can you forgive? We ask God to forgive us all the time. But it's not so easy when God says to us, 
so-and-so has said some very unkind things about you unjustly. And I expect you to forgive him. Lord, are you kidding? After all things I did for him? And he forgets what I did for him? Yeah, people do forget the kind things sometimes that others have done at their own inconvenience, but they've bothered to reach out and lift you up. Gratitude changes people. And you know something else? Gratitude changes churches. Many of you have experienced more than one church in your life. Many of you have careers that have demanded that you make geographic moves with all the inconvenience of resettling and getting new doctors and new dentists and learning your way around, etc. Gratitude can make an incredible difference in a congregation. You know, we've been through Harvey. We worshiped in a tent outside. Many of you sitting here remember that vividly. And now here we are, by the grace of God, rebuilt, refurnished, and have a beautiful house to worship in. Dear ones, it's not always easy to be grateful when you're hurting deeply, when disappointments have been profound, or when you actually think your own life is in jeopardy. Our faith says to us, guess who gave you your life? Guess who created you and loved you from the very beginning? Guess who gave you talents and intellects? Do you believe he made you just to abandon you? You will be provided what you need. You will be provided what you need. You have not been baptized into a faith that's easy. Most of you know that only too well. But there are some promises we have chosen to trust. <coughs> I love you with an everlasting love. Says the Lord. I love you with an everlasting love. Nothing you do is unforgivable. If you ask forgiveness and are willing to in turn share that forgiveness <coughs> to those who have hurt or disappointed you. Churches have a personality, have you noticed? And you and I contribute to the personality of New Hope Presbyterian Church. What is our contribution? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.